This is Tipping Point Radio. I'm Craig Merriweather, and you're listening to The Garden of the Mystics. Many of us are looking for a deeper sense of meaning, connection, and harmony with the world. And it can be a confusing experience here on Earth. We seem to be physical beings having a spiritual experience, but we're really spiritual beings having a physical experience, I think, or is it really the other way around? In this human, physical, spiritual experience, we need balance, presence, compassion, faith, love, integrity, surrender, and action. And that's a lot to take care of while also maintaining relationships, careers, finances, and our health. And technology hasn't seemed to have made things easier, only busier. So how do we, how can we grow spiritually in the 21st century? My guest today is Dan Millman, author of The Amazing Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Dan is a former world champion athlete, director of gymnastics at Stanford University, a martial arts instructor and college professor. After an intense 20-year spiritual quest, Dan's teachings found its form as a peaceful warrior's way, expressed fully in his books and lectures. Dan teaches worldwide and has influenced people from all walks of life, including leaders in the fields of health, psychology, education, business, politics, sports, entertainment, and the arts. Just some of Dan's other 14 books include The Four Purposes of Life, The Life You Were Born to Live, Living on Purpose, and The Laws of Spirit. Now here's my interview with Dan Millman. Hi, Dan. Welcome to the show. Hi, Craig. Good to be here. You know, uh, one of the things I was so excited to be talking to you about is that you've had this uh, amazing experience as an athlete, very much of the body. You you then even coached other people to uh, uh, in, in athletics, so teaching people about the body to be in the body, using the mind to be in the body. And then you had this incredible spiritual journey, this is a spiritual experience. And the tagline for this these series of interviews is conversations with experts in mind, body, and spiritual transformation. And it's it's rare, but very cool when I get to talk to somebody who has a foot firmly planted in both the physical realm and, and the spiritual realm. Because it seems to me that you know, a lot of us are in either or. Maybe we're 80% in the physical, trying to grasp hold of the spiritual world, or maybe we're more focused on the spiritual world, but we're not doing so on the physical world. So uh, is there any advice to start off with? And this is a huge question. How does one be grounded in both, you know, the spiritual having a physical experience and the physical experience having a, a spiritual awareness? How does one keep that t- together and grow in both? I think it's a very good question, very fundamental one. Um, there are people I know who are very much uh, into kind of escaping, transcending the body and, and all that that implies, um, the pain, the aging, and everything else. And, and they want to travel out of their bodies, but they haven't even gotten into them yet <laughs> in the form of really acknowledging that our body is the only thing we possess in a sense. We, uh, during our lifetime, we could lose... We could change or lose our ideas, our, our, our families, our house, our possessions. The one thing we're guaranteed to keep our entire lifetime is the body. And, and so that reminder uh, is, is a good criterion for taking good care of it. Um, one can only be enlightened or have spiritual experiences, uh, in a sense, in or with or through the body. So my background as an athlete and a coach has helped to, to keep me grounded. And, and this, this idea, the, the way that I teach, that I term the peaceful warrior's way, this idea of peaceful warrior is about living with a peaceful heart, but also acknowledging there are times we need a warrior's spirit. So one side balances the other, peaceful and warrior. Uh, and in a sense, that's why I recommend that we learn to live with our head in the clouds, but our feet on the ground. And, and that is, as you say, a stretch for many of us. It's not an either or. It's even been argued that enlightenment um, it takes place uh, in and as the body, not as a mind, which most people presume. Well, it reminds me of a photo I saw of the Dalai Lama, and uh, this photographer was given access to the Dalai Lama uh, throughout his day. So he spent like a week following the Dalai Lama. And there's this great picture of the Dalai Lama. Maybe I'll put it up on, on this interview webpage 
of uh, the Dalai Lama on a treadmill. So he's wearing all his robes, but he's on a treadmill. And I think, well, of course, he still has to take care of the body, exercise, because people are looking to him for advice and inspiration. And if he doesn't take care of himself and his body, then uh, he, he can't focus, if he's in pain and, and unhealthy, he can't focus on his spiritual side as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I, I don't know why this is a surprise, but we often we presume that uh, spirituality has, is about getting away from the body. That's an assumption from some of the Eastern traditions. Uh, but I, I think, on the contrary, um, we need to uh, be grounded in the body. Uh, and, in fact, when uh, the body is free from pain and discomfort, relatively so, um, it frees our attention to consider the higher topics of human life um, rather than being preoccupied. So taking good care of our body and, and uh, a sense of energy, uh, I think that's quite important. Well, but, and it also goes the other way, though. It, it, we often think, well, I, I have spiritual being having a physical experience, but some of us are really grounded in our bodies, and we struggle to have this spiritual experience. And there's a great line in, in one of your books, and you'll have to forgive me because I, I took all these great notes, and then I, I put them on the computer to make them more coherent, and then I forgot to put which book was from which quote. But uh, you said... Um, of course, there's nothing wrong with philosophical speculation, but let's not mistake conceptual thought for the spiritual practice of everyday life. After all, what does it serve to know whether angels wear earrings if we can't hold a regular job or maintain a long-term relationship? What good does it do to pray like a saint or meditate, meditate like a yogi if we're unchanged when we open our eyes? What good to attend a place of worship on Saturday or Sunday if we lack compassion on Monday. And I love that, uh, let's not mistake conceptual thought for spiritual practice in everyday life, but sometimes we mistake that thinking process for the the practice and the rehearsal and the, uh, you know, almost like a martial artist needs to practice um, um, the moves of being a martial art artist. We need to have the spiritual practice to to get to that higher plane. Well, exactly. I mean, spiritual life begins on the ground, not up in the air. Um, Thoreau said, um, even if you've built castles in the sky, he said, the work is not complete. He said, now build foundations under them. And, and, you know, Montaigne, the French philosopher, said, to strengthen the mind, you must harden the muscles. Uh, So rather than this mind-body split, um, I think we need to start to integrate the two. uh, and, And as you point out, so... But, but I, how, I don't think there is any actual differentiation. But how do we do that? If I'm stuck in the physical or if I'm stuck in the, the spiritual a majority of the time, how do, I, how do I make that balance? Is it possible to have balance? Well, I don't even actually know what it means to be stuck in the spiritual as if that's something different. In fact, I don't use the word spiritual very much. I know it's very common today, but it means so many different things to different people, Craig, you know that, that um, the one person it's all about metaphysics and fascination um, or, or to do with the, the mind, transcending and traveling and mystical experiences. Um, and there's a degree of that. I mean, people can generate uh, um, altered states of reality many, many different ways. We don't have to go into all of them from shamanistic practices, psychotropic substances. Some people just having a drink on the weekend, um, you know, changes their perceptual field. So there, and, and various kinds of meditation, breathing, uh, conscious hyperventilation called holotropic breath work. Um, can put people in states similar to LSD, but without any drugs. So there are many ways, but then we still come back to everyday life. Um, you know, there was a man who came to me once, uh, this really happened, and he, he said, Dan, I read your book, and, and you know, Peaceful Way of the Peaceful Warrior, and now I'm so interested in spiritual practice, but he said, I don't know how to approach it. He said, I have a wife and three children and a full-time job. And he came to understand, Craig, that his wife, his children, and his full-time job were his primary spiritual practices. And they will demand more and develop more than sitting in a cave and meditating somewhere. I know this because I've done both. So daily life 
is, is my approach, at least. What I teach daily life is the arena of the peaceful warrior. Uh, Earth is a school and daily life is our classroom. And that is guaranteed to teach us everything we need to learn in order to evolve and grow as human beings. Whether we read spiritual books or do meditation, daily life is our school. And that is the ultimate uh, integration of uh, spirituality. It's not just in a cave or in the East. It's right here, right now, in everyday life, moment to moment. Okay, I love, I love the classroom analogy because this leads into a, another quote of yours. It says, faith. Faith is the courage to live as if everything that happens is for our highest good. And here's the brilliant part in learning. Courage is the, faith is the courage to live as if everything that happens is for our highest good in learning. So it goes back to daily life being a classroom. And for many of us, uh, daily life is a form of spiritual weight, lift, weight training. You know, if, if you don't lift any weight, you don't get stronger. Uh, so daily life and the problems we encounter, the challenges we encounter, it calls forth our creativity, our courage, uh, our, our focus, and it develops these things. So what most people miss, well, let me tell you a quick story. When I was about, oh, maybe four years old, my sister was in charge of me in a circus. You know, we went to the circus and my parents said, you watch your little brother. Well, she got me something. She said, here, Danny, this is cotton candy. And being the bright young lad, I, I took that pink stuff and threw it out on the ground looking for the candy inside the, plastic, the, the, paper, the paper cone. And uh, I cried when she told me, you just threw out the candy, Dumbo. I was looking in the wrong place. Um, and, of course, there's that Nasruddin story. He's a, like a wise man from the East. And um, he was on his hands and knees uh, searching under a streetlight one day. And a friend of his said, Mullah, Mullah Nasruddin, what are you doing on your hands and knees? He said, oh, I'm searching for my key. I dropped it. And, and his friend said, well, about where did you drop it? Maybe I can help. And Nasruddin pointed across the street at his front door. And then said, I don't understand. If you drop the key across the street, why are you searching here? And Nasruddin said, well, you think I'm a fool? The light is bright, much brighter here. Mm-hmm. So it's another story about how we look in the wrong places. Um, we're looking elsewhere for spiritual life, somewhere elevated and, and in the East and so on, when it's right here in front of us. If we just open our eyes, but well, let me just, I hope this isn't too long a monologue, but there's a great quote uh, by Hillel, I think it was. He said, there are three mysteries in this world, air to the birds, water to the fish, and humanity to itself. And we're immersed in spirit, in beauty, in inspiration every day. The weather person doesn't come on the radio or television saying 20% chance of rain today and 30% spirit out. Spirit is always here. Beauty is always here. But we don't pay attention. We're not noticing it because we're too preoccupied with what am I going to do about my relationship? How am I going to fix my financial situation? What? How am I going to solve this decision I have in front of me? What am I going to do about my physical ailments? So our, our attention is trapped uh, and preoccupied. But in moments of free attention, we start to notice. We look up like a young child with the eyes of the child and go, wow, look at this. So that's what we have to do is start to pay attention. Okay, yes, but you also mentioned that one of our biggest problems with living in the now, in the present life, is that we're bored with our lives. And so we do go out and look for maybe more mystical experiences of maybe Eastern religion, something we're not familiar with. And, you know, I've, I was interviewing um, Dr. Daniel Amen a while ago. We were talking about ADD. And he says ADD is a problem of, of adrenaline. People get bored if they don't have that adrenaline in their life. And that's where ADD comes from. And if if we're you know, seeking that adrenaline, yeah, maybe we'll go for the uh, uh, drama in our life because that gives us adrenaline and we're not so bored. And if we're constantly in our present day life, we're seeking something else probably because we're bored. So how, how do we find that spiritual satisfaction and growth in everyday life when we're just bored out of our heads? Well, this is a pandemic, this, this issue of boredom. Um, uh, most of us, 
seek more and more spicy foods, more uh, taste sensations. In movies, people seem to gravitate toward bigger and bigger spectacle, the CGI, and just a simple drama doesn't always capture our attention. Um, and people get want more and more and stronger, and we need to turn that around. I did a when I was in my intensive spiritual seeking um, many years ago. I spent a decade doing many different kinds of approaches, practices. One of them I remember was uh, an exercise in sensory deprivation. I spent an entire weekend in a room. I actually chose the YMCA. I got a you know a small room. I needed to find a room by myself. And just with them, I took all the furniture out. They let me do that. I had a mattress on the floor. Um, I covered the windows with, with um, sheet cut brought, so it was semi-dark. Not pitch dark, but semi-dark. No stimulation. All I had, I had no reading, no television, no computers, no nothing. Just the mattress, me. I could, And I was supposed to keep my eyes mostly closed if I went down the hall to the bathroom and come back into the room. That's all I did that weekend. I ate a little bit. I got a little bit of food, but not much, um, and just sat in this room for the entire weekend. That is, it was quite a challenge, alone with my thoughts, with nothing to do. And when I left on Monday morning, I stepped out into that out of that YMCA. I looked around. Life. I, I was looking with the eyes of a child again, because after that period of confrontation with boredom. Uh, I, I looked at the world with fresh eyes. That's why we like to travel. You know, when I go to Europe to travel, I'll, I'll be going down the street on a trolley, a normal trolley ride, but I'm thrilled. Everything's bright and new. I'm looking. I say, oh, look, a laundromat, because it's in Europe. It's a, it's a different environment. When we go up in the mountains camping, suddenly we see these glorious panoramas. So it pulls us out of ourselves. So, again, um, the, the ultimate confrontation with boredom is a technique we call meditation. We just sit with our eyes closed, no stimulation, and we start seeing our thoughts. Time can seem to go very slowly. At other times of absorption, it goes quickly. But we can break this addiction to more and more by, by doing a little meditation every day, just sitting and closing our eyes and tolerating that. Or not having to look at our cell phone or be stimulated all the time. And it retunes. It re, it's like we're pressing the reset on our senses. So we begin to pay attention. You know, today it's become very fashionable to call it mindfulness and being mindful. But it really, we reawaken our ability to pay attention to the simple beauty of what's around us right now. And that, that helps so much with life because there's a, there's this uh, really cool passage in your book, uh, The Four Purposes of Life. Uh, towards the end, you talk about the video game Snood, if I'm pronouncing that right. And it was yeah. kind, of, kind of a shooting game kind of thing. But you, you're saying like every five or six shots, the, the game kind of changes its configuration of how things are coming at you. And you, it's just like life. Once you think you have a handle on it, the game, they're, they're going to throw you curveballs. And the game's going to change on you. And the only real way to kind of keep in uh, the game of, of and grow spiritually and, and be in this physical plane is just have that meditative state of being in, in the now. Well, it's, life comes at us in a, in, in a series of moments. Life unfolds like a series of waves. And sometimes those waves are ripples, and sometimes they're tsunamis, tidal waves. And we can't predict or control the waves of change. Most of us have recognized that. Things happen. But we can learn to surf. And that is kind of learning to a more improvisational approach to life. We can make plans. We can plan our day, running errands and so on, but we shouldn't become too attached to the plans because life unfolds however it will. We may have to change those plans. So I use the game of snood as an example of how things shift. You have to shift with it and just say, oh, what now? But, but um, what if I don't know we, how to shift? Yeah, let's, so. let's say I'm, I'm dancing the tango. And I'm doing great, and all of a sudden life shifts it to a waltz. I have no idea how to dance a waltz. Now what do I do? Well, life, that's life's way of saying it's time to learn to waltz. <laughs> so I like your analogy, but um, it's not what if I don't know how. In other words, life constantly reminds us. Uh, lessons repeat themselves until we learn them. 
And if we don't learn easy lessons in life, they get more dramatic to get our attention. That's why I say it's a perfect school, because we will eventually learn everything we need to know. And you quoted that law of faith about the courage to live as if. It doesn't ask us to believe anything. Faith just says, live as if. Everything that happens is for our highest good. Do I know that's true? No. But I'm going to live on that basis as if it were true, because it makes for a different kind of life. So it's not as if, how do we do it? We just do it. Let's say we ordered uh, our, you know, we went to this restaurant we've been looking forward to for two weeks. We're with company and we're saying, ah, because they have made the best desserts. Let's say we really love apple pie and we're just so looking forward to it. And then it's time for, to order dessert and you order your apple pie. And they say, oh, we're sorry. We just ran out of it. It's just, it was very popular tonight. That person that's sitting next to you at that table, uh, they're having a last piece. So we're really sorry. Now, you can again resist the moment and say, wait a minute, it's on your menu. I came here. I've been waiting for two weeks and do all that trauma. Or you can just go, oh, okay, I have a chance to um, try something new. In other words, you just shifted from the tangle to the waltz or vice versa on the turn of the dime. So we learn. Uh, we, we suffer until we learn. And eventually we learn to flow with life. We apply one of the spiritual laws I teach in one of my books called The Laws of Spirit, called um, The Law of Surrender. And like any good martial artist, we learn to flow with what comes our way and make use of it. Well, uh, apropos that you mentioned that book, because another one of the laws is, uh, laws of spirit is the law of faith. And you say, uh, when the sage talks to the traveler, this is kind of a fictional account, it's a really fun, cool book, uh, but it's, you say, what if, or the sage says to the traveler, what if you suddenly knew with certainty that a higher intelligence was working through you and everyone else for the highest good of humanity, that there is indeed a purpose for every pleasure and hardship? And that's a hard f thing to get your head around. It, there, there's a purpose to my hardship. I, I don't know that I want to accept that. Well, we don't have to. I don't tell people what to believe. But the question is, which uh, helps you more? Which makes your life more resourceful? Uh, I don't know if you saw the movie The Life of Pi, but it was a wonderful movie. And at the very end of the movie, it ends, and it's not giving anything away, because no one who hasn't seen it, it's not a spoiler. But at the end of the movie, someone, uh, the line comes out, so you have two stories, two narratives of life unfolding. Which one do you prefer? And we can pick the one we prefer because models of reality, no one can prove whether there's reincarnation, whether it exists or not, or whether we go to heaven when we die. And, you know, no one knows any of this. People say they do, but no, nobody's come back to tell us really. Um, so we can choose what narrative makes our life make more sense and is more resourceful. So do again, we go back to, for example, there's an idea that we, that our soul chooses. Everything that ever happens to us, good and bad, before we're born, and the contract we made. Now, do I know that's true? Absolutely not. I have no idea. But if I live, if that were true, then it makes me less a victim. If something difficult happens, I don't whine and complain. I go, well, if I chose this on some level for my highest good, I might as well make the best of it. Mm. And so it... We approach life in a different way, using these resourceful models, recognizing they're simply models of reality uh, that help us to approach life with a different attitude. Yeah. I want to focus on your website really quick, because I know we're getting uh, close to the end of our time. And uh, the website is PeacefulWarrior.com. I highly recommend you uh, reserve some time to just kind of hang out and, and look around the website, because there's a lot here. But I was wondering if you could talk about uh, some of the stuff that's on here because there's some e-courses. And I was wondering if you could talk a, a, just a little bit about what's there and, and what people can do on your website in terms of the e-courses the e there. Well, thanks for asking, Craig. Um, I, I'm quite uh, happy with these uh, electronic courses. I have three digital courses, and they're, they're taught by at a website called dailyom.com. Um, and they link at PeacefulWarrior.com. One of them is Master the Path of the Peaceful Warrior. It's a 12-week course, um, and it goes through uh, the essential keys to living uh, a full and rich life 
a life of personal growth. In fact, I define personal growth uh, based on um, 12 aspects of life. Discover your worth, reclaim your will, energize your body, manage your money, uh, tame your mind, and so on. And there are 12 areas of life that constitute the entire area of personal growth. Another of the courses is the Peaceful Warrior Workout uh, with video and so on. I teach a very effective workout I've done every day for 28 years, and it can be done in less than four minutes a day. It's based on the principle a little of something is better than a lot of nothing. Then the third course is taught by my daughter and I with video and audio, um, and it's um, the creative compass. It's actually a course in creativity, enhancing creativity and writing skills uh, for anyone who likes to write or communicate. Um, it's called Discover Your Creative Compass. What's neat about these courses is people can pay whatever they wish, as much or as little as they wish. So at any, it's affordable for anyone. Um, and I also have something you'll notice on the left-hand side of my homepage at PeacefulWarrior.com. Uh, there's a, a link called Life Purpose. And if anyone clicks on that Life Purpose link, they'll be taken to a Life Purpose calculator. They just put in their date of birth, and they will see some information, a teaser, just a taste of material I have in another one of, or two of my books that uh, addresses a hidden calling in that person's life. I know it sounds kind of bizarre, but it's quite accurate. I've worked with it for 25 years. I'm based on a book called The Life You Were Born to Live. Well, speaking of books, uh, let's say somebody uh, is just finding out about you now and is, is interested in, in learning more about you and what you have to say, or maybe they know of you from Way of the Peaceful Warrior, but don't realize that you have something incredible like 14 other books uh, plus audio programs and things. Where does one start? Uh, do you have a recommendation on, on you know, because it's a little overwhelming, 14, which one do you go to first? Do you do them in chronological order, go back, back to the, uh, from the end to the beginning? What should one do? Well, there's, there's no best book or teacher. There's just the best one for each of us at a given time in our life. So I would recommend someone just go to PeacefulWarrior.com. They can click on my books, look them over. There are descriptions there and see what sings for them. Most people have started with Way of the Peaceful Warrior. That's my signature book. It's a good introduction to my work. Um, and each book has a, is a different facet of what I call a Peaceful Warrior's approach to daily life. And, and we're all Peaceful Warriors in training because we're all seeking to live with a more peaceful heart. But again, there are times we need a warrior spirit. So I hope my work helps people to do both. Yeah. Uh, and also, if you, uh, on, on, if you go to the website, you'll see events and, and uh, the people can find you around, around the country and actually around the world. You actually, I believe, just finished up a program in Costa Rica, which sounded really cool. So go to events and see where Dan is next. And we're kind of out of time, but I wanted to ask one more question a quick thing, there is a quote I heard uh, uh, you talk about, and I think it's one of the most interesting and and mind-wrapping around quotes I've heard in a long time, and it's, I wonder if you could just give your kind of um, uh, take on what it means, but it's from Zorba the Greek, I believe, and it says, if you could dance what I just said, then maybe I'd understand, and I was wondering if you could explain, oh, yeah. explain what that means to you. I would be happy to. There's, a, there's another related quote. A Will Shoots back in the 60s uh, popularized the phrase, lose your mind and come to your senses. In other words, rather than being preoccupied with our thoughts, is to come back to the body um, and feel it, move it, with it, appreciate the senses. In the future, I'm writing a new book. I'm start, just starting work on the third and final book in the Peaceful Warrior Trilogy. And it's going to take people through a, a, a contemplation on life and death and life again with a new appreciation for what life represents. So, again, that brings us full circle to what we started talking about at the beginning, which is coming back to the body, the foundation of our life, and doing what's necessary to help it be flexible and strong and feel vital and, and full of energy. And that uh, enhances every human capacity including our sense of uh, spirit in everyday life. Oh, 
Thank you so much, Dan. I so appreciate your time. I, I just one quick thing. You know, Nick Nolte as Socrates in the Peaceful Warrior movie. Awesome casting. Right. I love that. That was uh, brilliant. So uh, thank you so much for, for all that you do and the books. I, I love your books and the stories, the, the way you weave them into semi-fictional kind of accounts and stories. I, I love that. It really touches me, and I, I get a lot out of that type of storytelling. And and I, I would love to have you back sometime, and, and I definitely – going to come visit you in Costa Rica when you do one of those uh, warrior workshops again. That's great, Craig. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on.